Hello! In this video, we're going to talk about a way to efficiently dispense values from data structures. And in particular, we want some way in Java that is uniform across all the different data structures that we've studied. So we, we have array lists, uh, link lists, stacks and queues that are implemented uh, in different ways. And we'd like some uniform and efficient way to go through the values of these structures as well as uh, other applications. And the way that Java provides to do this is something called the iterator interface. And iterators can actually not only dispense values from, from data structures, but we'll also see how they can generate a series of values as well as filter values uh, out of a sequence. You can even have an iterator that iterates over other iterators for sort of an iterator inception. And another nice property of uh, iterators is that they are what facilitate the for each style of loop in Java. And we'll see an example of that at the end of this topic. So to start out, let's look at how we might implement a method called count. And this method takes in a list of data. And here I'm using the list interface type in Java, which includes uh, array list and link list. So we have some kind of list, and it contains uh, objects. And we're looking for uh, how many times does some particular object appear in this list. In order to do this, we might have a for loop that loops through a number of times equal to the number of things in our list. And for each index, it uses the get method, which is provided by the list interface to get the element at that index, and then uh, uses the dot equals method of an object. And equals is a method that all objects in Java have. Though if you want it to uh, function correctly for a class that you implement, you have to implement your own version of equals that actually compares the relevant things. Uh, for that class, but all objects in Java have a dot equal, so we can always call it, though, uh, if it's not implemented correctly, it, it obviously won't work. But for each object in our list, we're going to say if that object equals the one we're looking for, increment our count. And one bit of Java syntax I want to highlight here is notice that there are no curly braces around this if, and this is actually legal Java. and when you omit the curly braces from a conditional or from a loop, Java will treat just the next line until it sees a semicolon as what's inside that if or loop. So this if only includes the next line, which in this case is, is all we want. So I typically uh, don't do this when I write my own code because if I add another line to this uh, without remembering that I left off the curly braces, that line's not going to be inside the if, even though I might be expecting it to. Uh, but in a lot of Java code, you will see uh, folks leave out these curly braces. It's just sort of a convenience thing. Uh, so I just wanted you to be aware that that is, in fact, something you can do in Java. Um, so we might ask, all right, does this count method work on all the structures we have studied so far? The answer is no, and the answer is no in different senses for different structures. So one important thing is that this method get with a particular index is not defined on stacks and queues. Uh, so count doesn't work at all. Stacks and queues do not implement this list interface. Uh, so that's one issue. Uh, this get is also slow on some structures. So we know that it's constant time uh, for an array list because that's the random access uh, indexing where we can get the value at any index in constant time. But for a singly or doubly linked list to get the value at a particular position in the list, we have to loop through the nodes of the list, so, uh, either from the start or from the tail if we keep track of the tail. Um, and let's kind of break down what this means for performance in terms of time uh, of count on linked lists. So if we uh, total up all the steps that are required uh, by the calls to, to get inside this loop and count, here's, here's what we find. When we get the first node, 
in our linked list, that just visits one node. When we get the node at index one, that visits two nodes, the first and the second. When we get index two, first, second, and third, and so on until when we get the last node in our list, that will visit all n nodes in the list. So these are all the, the calls to get inside this loop that we do once for every uh, node in our list. And then besides that, there's going to be a constant number of uh, additional steps each loop uh, where we do this comparison, where we add one to i, where we call equals, and maybe where we add to count. But really, in terms of uh, an amount of work that changes as we go through the uh, loop, that's the call to get. And so if we total this all up, 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to plus n for all these calls to get, uh, that will work out to n plus 1 times n over 2. You might see this by pairing up elements uh, in this series. So we have n plus 1, then we have n minus 1 plus 2, which works out to n plus 1 again then n minus 2 plus 3, that works out to n plus 1. And so if we just take these pairs, they all add up to n plus 1, and we have n over 2 of them because we're taking pairs out of our list. And so this works out to n squared plus n divided by 2, which means that this count method takes a number of steps proportional to n squared. Right, that we have these other factors plus n and divided by 2, uh, but the total is going to be proportional to n squared in some way. And when this is the case, we say that this uh, method or code takes quadratic or polynomial time. And this is actually significantly worse than linear time as n gets really big. And you can, you can think is uh, when, when n is 1, there are n and n squared are, are both 1. When n is 10, n squared is 100. When n is 100, n squared is 10,000. And so you can see n squared is going to grow much, much faster than n. So when we're dealing with really big lists, n squared might, might be quite slow. And we can see this intuitively, but we have this loop over each element in our node, uh, uh, each element in our list. So that's a sort of linear time operation where we're looping through each node. And then within that loop, it contains another linear time operation, this get method, which again is going to loop through some number of nodes in order to find one at a particular index. And so when we have kind of a linear operation within another linear time operation, so this get within this loop over all nodes, kind of have linear times linear, and that's this n squared, this quadratic performance. So this count doesn't work on stacks and queues. It's going to be pretty slow on linked lists and double linked lists. So we'd really want something that can do, can do this sort of thing better. So we want to traverse data structures in a general efficient way. And efficient means not quadratic, ideally constant time to get the next element that, that we want. And we want to use the same interface across all our different structures so that there is kind of a, a uniform way that this works. And this is going to come from the iterator interface provided in Java. And so we've seen that the st structures that we've studied uh, have had kind of some common operations that had size, is empty, add, remove. And what I haven't shown you is that all of these also provide a method for efficient data traversal, and that is this public method iterator that returns something of type iterator. Uh, and the, this iterator is also generic, right? It's an iterator over some type of uh, objects E. And if we have an array list of strings, its iterator will also uh, will iterate over strings um, and so on. So this, uh, as I've said, these iterators are going to be able to traverse elements of uh, a data structure, and we call that iteration. They're going to be able to produce val values uh, in some sequence, and we call that generation. And they're also going to be able to select certain values uh, from a sequence, and we'll call that filtering. So the kind of minimal interface for the iterator is 
you can ask, uh, are there more elements left in this uh, iterator? Has next returns true or false? And you can call next to get the next element in the iterator. And, that's, and this is sort of this minimal uniform interface. Uh, and then each data structure is going to have sort of a customized implementation uh, of, of how these work. So first I'd like to show a, an example of an of a iterator that generates values. Uh, and this is going to be for the uh, generating the values of the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, and if you're not familiar with this, this is a sequence of numbers where uh, it's going to start with one, one, and then every successive uh, number is the sum of the two preceding numbers. Uh, so this means we have one, one, and then the next number is the sum of the previous two, then the next number is the sum of the previous two, so one plus two is three, and then two plus three is five, and three plus five is eight, and on and on. And so we'd like to make this uh, iterator um, that implements our iterator over integers interface, and I'll import this uh, iterator from from Java, and then I'll go ahead and add uh, the two the the two methods that every iterator needs. And before I get to those, uh, I'll de I'll declare the the private fields, the data that this iterator is going to keep track of in order to be able to produce the next the next element. So we're going to have a private uh, int uh, that's the uh, length. Of the the sequence that we're that we're generating, uh, we're going to have uh, a private int that's the uh, that's a current number and a private int that's the next number, uh, and then we'll have a constructor that takes in an int n that is going to be the length, and then the kind of current number that we'll start our uh, Fibonacci iterator on is one. Right, the sequence starts at one, and then the next uh, Fibonacci number that it will return will also be one. So the current keeps track of the current one we're on. Next is the, the one after that. All right, so now we have our private fields, our constructor that initializes them to the starting values. Uh, for has next, we're just going to return uh, length greater than or equal to zero because uh, we're going to use length to keep track of uh, kind of how many um, uh, elements of the Fibonacci sequence we have left to uh, generate from this iterator. Uh, and then for our next, we're going to uh, save our uh, current uh, value in a temporary variable, and then we're going to be returning, uh, returning that at the end. Uh, but in between there, we're going to update our current next and length to kind of move the iterator uh, to the, the next uh, element of the Fibonacci sequence, which is that uh, current is going to become the next uh, element in our, our sequence, and that next is going to be current uh, plus its old value of temp. Uh, and so this is doing this, the next element is going to be the sum of the previous two. And finally, we need to subtract uh, from length so that our, our iterator is designed to uh, generate a kind of finite number of elements from the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, and so if I uh, then uh, write a main method so we can test this out, and in my main method, I'm going to create a Fibonacci iterator and call it iter. Say we'll look at the first 15 Fibonacci numbers, and then while this iterator has a next number to give us, I will print out that next number. And so if I go ahead and run this, we'll see uh, that indeed we get the first uh, 15 numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. All right, so this is cool. And let me tell you why it's cool. Uh, we could, uh, if we wanted to get the first uh, n Fibonacci numbers, we could calculate uh, each time we want the uh, uh, one up to n, we could calculate it all the way to there. So 
uh, each time that we want a Fibonacci number, we could do we could go through the whole sequence, adding them up to get that number. Uh, but that would be slow each time we want a number. We have to kind of go through the whole sequence up to that point. And a kind of key observation here is that to find the nth number of this sequence, we need to calculate the previous numbers in the sequence because it's that's how it's defined. And by having an iterator that keeps track of uh, kind of where we are in the sequence, we can easily generate the next number in constant time, right? That this next method does not depend on where we are in the sequence in terms of the number of the number of steps it does, how much work it has to do. And so we are using this iterator to be able to traverse the sequence, to generate the values in the sequence uh, very efficiently kind of one element at a time. And uh, we can do the same thing for, for data structures. So let's talk about iterating over structures. Um, we're going to define an iterator for each structure. Remember I said that we have this iterator interface, this has next and next, and it's we need to customize this uh, for each uh, type of structure that we want to iterate over because uh, they're kind of different in, internally. And uh, in particular, we're going to implement this uh, public iterator method on our uh, array list, on our singly linked list, and so on. It's going to return an iterator over the values in that structure. And what has next and next do is going to depend on what's going on inside that structure. So for a singly linked list iterator, we're going to need to keep track of uh, kind of which node we're on. And in contrast, our array list iterator is going to keep track of uh, the index of the next element to return. So if we have a structure uh, with an iterator method, we can rewrite our count method uh, in this fashion, where we get an iterator uh, over our structure, and then while that iterator has a next element, that we ask it that uh, if the element we're looking for is equal to that next element. Uh, and so this has removed these repeated calls to get a uh, get of a particular index that were uh, slow for our linked lists and that our stacks and queues didn't implement at all. Uh, but all of those structures do implement this iterator, this iterator method. So one way that you might think about doing this is to have a separate class, say singly linked list iterator, and have that have the constructor for that class take in the list uh, or the other structure that it is iterating over. But this is going to cause a problem because what we want to do to do this efficiently requires access to sort of the private internal data of our data structures. So uh, for, uh, for our linked list, if we want to kind of, if we keep track of the node we're on and we want to use that node's next field to get uh, to the next node as we're iterating through it, none of the public methods of our linked list ever return a list node object. They're only returning uh, the value that's stored in a node or the index of a node. And so if we designed an iterator that could only use the public methods of our list, it wouldn't be able to iterate over it in an efficient way. We'd be back to call, making calls to get, which we know is slow. So instead, we're going to use a technique called inner classes. And this is a way to kind of define a new kind of object that exists kind of only inside another class. And in fact, we've already seen examples of this. Whenever we've made a linked list class, we have defined inside of it uh, this uh, another private class called list node. And this is uh, in contrast to having a separate like list node.java uh, that defines a list node class. There's some good reasons why we want to to kind of nest it inside our singly linked list class 
instead of having it be its own separate thing. Uh, so one part of this uh, is that making it an inner class simplifies the implementation um, of both the list node and the singly linked list. So when it's an inner class like this, we can directly access a node's next uh, and data fields. If it was its own separate class, uh, the linked list class would not be able to go inside the list node and, and access its fields directly. Uh, we'd have to define a bunch of, uh, we'd have to define, for example, getters and setters like get data, set data, get next, set next for our list node class that the singly linked list would then use. So it kind of simplifies the code to have this list node kind of inside the singly linked list class where, uh, where we have direct access to its fields. Um, there's also sort of a, a design element to this where logically a list node is not ever something that should just exist on its own, not part of any linked list. The only time list nodes should exist is as part of a linked list. And if we don't want list nodes to ever be created on their own outside of our linked list class, one way to make that happen is to make it this private inner class, that it's a class that is only accessible and can only be used inside our singly linked list class, just like our private fields are only accessible inside the class where they're defined. And finally, if any time we, there would be, it would be useful to have another type of object as part of a data structure's implementation, we'll create a, a, a pro, an inner class uh, for that purpose. And the same idea is going to apply to iterators. So let me show you what I mean. I've uh, coded up here a singly linked list uh, implementation. It uh, has our, our inner class list node, uh, constructor, uh, some of the standard methods we've seen is empty size, add and remove first, add and remove last. So that's all, uh, that's all good. And I'm going to say that this class implements the iterable interface. And uh, this iterable interface uh, is going to require that we have the iterator method that returns an iterator. Uh, over the values in this class, and then as an inner class inside this linked list, I'm going to define my singly linked list iterator uh, that is going to implement the iterator interface, and this is going to uh, keep track of a list node. Uh, that's the current node that it's on. It's going to need a constructor where it sets the current equal to the head of our list. Our iterator is going to start at the head of the list and go through the nodes from there. We have our has next. Uh, method that all iterators have to implement is going to return uh, if current is not null, then we have a have a next node to return. And then we're going to return the value at the current node we're on when we call next. And this is going to uh, say our value is going to be the value at the current node. And then we're going to update current to be the next node in the list and then return value. And so now we have this private class, which just kind of keeps, which is doing exactly what we do uh, when we loop through the nodes in our list, it has a, a variable that keeps track of the node that it's on uh, and continually updates that to the next one. And the important thing is that this is going to be an object that maintains this information about which node that it's on. And so every time we ask it for the next node, it is a constant time operation to go from the node it's currently on to the next one. It doesn't have to start over from the head and go all the way through. 
And so then in our uh, iterator method, we're going to make a new uh, singly uh, linked list iterator and return that uh, so that whoever is calling this iterator method gets this singly linked list iterator that can go through, go through the nodes. And this uh, code right here is what is going to let our, uh, say our, our count method that we talked about earlier, um, uh, go through the elements of our linked list just as efficiently as it would the elements of an array list because we now have this iterator object that keeps track of the node that we're on. This is a big improvement over repeated calls to the linear time get method where we were having to kind of refine uh, the node each time. All right, a few more examples of things we can do with iterators. We're going to uh, talk about a skip iterator, an iterator that will know to skip a certain value as it iterates through. Uh, a reverse iterator that we can actually use to uh, give us elements in the reverse order that some other iterator would give us. So what would this skip iterator look like? Let's say we want to iterate through uh, the elements of, of some structure, but there's a certain value that we want to skip over. And so we could write, every time we want to do this, we could write kind of the special purpose code to, uh, with uh, if statements to check uh, what we need to skip, but we could also just create this new class skip iterator that takes any iterator and does the skipping for us. And uh, the skip iterator is going to ensure that the next element that we get from our iterator is never going to be the one that we want to skip over. And we're not, this can be its own separate public class because it only needs to use the public methods of some other iterator. Uh, it doesn't need this privileged access to private internal data the way that our singly linked list iterator does, so it doesn't need to be an inner class. And so here's what the code for that would look like. Uh, our two fields will be uh, the iterator that we're processing, right? The original iterator that we're going to be skipping over some part of, and then we're going to keep track of the value that we actually want to skip. When we construct a skip iterator, it's going to take the original iterator and the value to skip, and then it's just going to use the has next uh, method of the underlying iterator. And then when we call next, it's going to just it's going to get the next element from the underlying iterator. And then while uh, that value equals the value that we want to skip, we just keep getting the next one. So we sort of keep getting the next until we hit a value that isn't the one we're skipping. Uh, and then we return that. And with this fairly small amount of code, we now have this kind of new uh, way of filtering out values. So this is the, the use of iterators I talked about where, where we could filter out values um, uh, from, from some sequence. Uh, also, let's, we can look at the, the reverse iterator um, where we can dispense elements from an iterator, but in the opposite order. And this is going to kind of use this trick where we're actually just going to maintain a private uh, uh, list where um, uh, when we construct our reverse iterator, it's going to take the original iterator, it's going to create a linked list, and it's going to just get all the elements from the original iterator and add them to the beginning of our linked list. And uh, if we just keep adding each element to the beginning of our linked list, uh, it's going to serve to reverse them the same way that pushing elements on the top of a stack does. And in fact, adding to the beginning of a linked list is how we implemented a stack uh, using a linked list. And so we'll, we'll build up this linked list of all the values uh, from the original iterator, but in reverse order. And then we'll just keep track of an iterator over that list. And that's our, our private field here. And then the other methods of our reverse iterator can just use the uh, methods of this uh, private iterator that we made uh, over the list of the, of the values in reverse order. All right, last thing, uh, I said we we're gonna see how iterators uh, enable this for each loop. So recall that if we have, say, an array of strings, 
um, all the world is a stage, uh, we could write a loop like this that says for uh, uh, string s uh, in our array. And this is a loop where we're not keeping track of the index of the element we're on, like for i equals zero, i less than array dot length, i plus plus, right? That's a loop over the indexes of our array. This is a loop over the elements of our array. We have our loop variable uh, s, and it's just assigned to each element um, of our array in turn. And this kind of for each loop is analogous to the uh, for value in list kind of style of loop that uh, you're familiar with from, from Python. And we could rewrite our count method uh, to use this same uh, style of for each loop that we kind of for each uh, object in our list of data that we check if it equals the, the object that we're counting and increment the count. Uh, so why is it that we can uh, use this for each loop with this uh, list data? Like what is it that lets us do that? Uh, it's because the list interface provides this iterator method. Any object that provides the iterator method, we can use uh, as part of, we can use a for each loop to loop over the elements uh, in, that, in that list. So we can kind of say for element uh, in kind of whatever collection of, of stuff we have, uh, as long as that uh, collection of stuff implements our iterable interface. And uh, if you uh, recall, I did that for our singly linked list, right? The, the first thing I did was I added this implements iterable uh, to the singly linked list, which says, all right, this is a structure that can be iterated over, that provides an iterator. You can use the for each loop with it. Uh, and so that meant that we had to provide this iterator. And then I made the private singly linked list iterator class. And so any uh, class that implements this iterable interface can be used with uh, this for each loop. All right, so uh, all the structures we've studied so far uh, are the array list and linked list classes, the stack, queue, and deck interfaces. These all implement iterable, so we can all use them for with the for each loop, uh, they, we can all uh, iterate efficiently uh, over their values using this kind of uniform interface for all of them. All right, so uh, that's all I have to say about iterators, uh, and I look forward to seeing your questions.